Coming back to the second part of my lecture on Maya Angelou's Africa, let us look at the various features of the poem today. In the last class, we spoke about the various figures of speech, extended metaphor, refrain, anaphora, anthemaria, imagery, and this time let us locate these in the poem. An extended metaphor, as I told you the last time, is a metaphor that is used throughout a poem. An example is John Donne's use of the compass compared to the two lovers in A Valediction Forbidden Modern. And in this particular poem, you can find that the continent of Africa is compared to a woman throughout the poem. So that's an example of an extended metaphor. Then we have the refrain, a line repeated in a poem with sometimes a turn in meaning as the poem progresses. In this particular poem, we can see the line, Thus she had lain. And then towards the end of the, poem, the, end of the first stanza, it becomes, Thus she has lain. In the next stanza, towards the end, we find, Thus she has lain. And in the third stanza, we finally we find, Although she has lain. And in the last class, I told you how the meaning changes as the poem po progresses. And then we have the anaphora, a word or a phrase repeated at the beginning of the line. When we go to the last stanza, we find that the word remember is repeated again and again. Remember her pain, remember the losses, remember her riches. And the word remember figures as an example for anaphora. And an anaphora, anaphora is generally employed to reinforce of a, a reinforce a sense of meaning and it is repeated for highlighting something and in this particular case her memory that it is used to enhance the technique of memorialization as Maya Angelou wants to highlight the trauma that she went through and then we have the figure of speech called Anthe Maria Anthemaria is a rhetorical term for the creation of a new word or expression by using one part of speech or word class in place of another. This was a favorite of Robert Frost and if you go, if you have studied his poem, The Pasture, he says, come let us clean the pasture spring. The pasture in the phrase pasture spring normally functions as a noun, but in that particular phrase, the word pasture qualifies the word spring and therefore it functions as an adjective. So you see how a word that generally functions as a noun is transformed into another part of speech. So that is an example for Anthe Maria. In this particular poem, you can see this phrase, sugar cane sweet. Sugar cane is normally employed as a noun, but in this particular case, you see that sugar cane qualifies the word sweet and therefore it functions as a, an adjective. And then you have another example of Anthe Maria in this particular line. Church her with Jesus. Church is normally employed as a noun but in this particular line since she uses the word church to show how the religion of Christianity was imposed upon the native people. She uses the word church to reinforce the idea of it being a deliberate action. And then of course you have the various kinds of imagery. There are, Technically there are seven kinds of imagery. But in this particular poem we have the visual imagery, auditory imagery and organic imagery. Coming to the first one, the visual imagery. This is the kind of imagery that you normally find in most poems. Here you find the various geographical evocatively, geographical features evocatively described. The deserts her hair, gold in her feet, mountains her breast, two niles her tears. And then we have the auditory imagery. Her screams loud and way that uh, very evocatively highlight the trauma that she experienced as a rape victim herself. And again, you have the trauma of the native people who are spiritually and physically raped by the colonizers. And then you have organic imagery. Organic imagery refers to a phenomena whereby 
you describe something in a poem and but you do not name it it throughout the poem you you find that the thing is described or it may be a thing or a phenomena but it is not named in this particular poem if you keep the title aside you can find that africa is described but no way is it named if you don't have the title you cannot understand what it is so we only have clues like the niles and black and yeah that's it we have just those clues and therefore if if apart from the title it is left to the imagination and then let us look at the i have listed out these various figures of speech here and now let us go on to the different important themes culture versus nature africa is portrayed in terms of its geographical features mountains as a breast deserts as hair the two niles the tears as she lies passively in all her beauty and she lies in the first line first line where she says she has lay she lies down passively she is vulnerable and she hurt she is vulnerable to the exploitation not only by colonialism but by culture as well and then we have the man versus woman dichotomy okay the coming of the brigands the bandits are portrayed with masculine phallic symbols like icicles and guns they conquer the land characterized by traits of a woman so this depicts the physical rape and spiritual rape of a woman as a woman is never endowed with her own opinion she has to always abide by the dictates of a man so you find that kind of analogy also there and then you have the colonialism versus motherland dialectical pair also there uh there was a pro white superiority complex that some european states felt at stealing territory larger than themselves and you see that colonialism actually bifurcated the country into two the colonial european population on one hand and the indigenous population on the other there was also racial segregation where you had the white colonial citizen on one hand and the black african subject on the other you can also make an a comparative analysis of this poem with africa by the singalese poet david diop and cr- many critics believe that diop was utilizing an old trope of africa as a woman and specifically a mother to the african people so you can see this same kind of uh, comparisons in this poem as well africa my africa africa of proud warriors in ancestral savannas africa of whom my grandmother sings on the banks of the distant river i have never known you but your blood flows in my veins your beautiful black blood that irrigates the fields the blood of your sweat the sweat of your work the work of your slavery africa tell me africa is this your back that is unbent this back that never breaks under the weight of humiliation this back trembling with red scars and saying no to the whip under the, under the midday sun but a grave voice answers me impetuous child the tree young and strong that tree over there splendidly alone amidst white and weighted flowers that is your africa springing up anew springing up patiently obstinately whose fruit bit by bit acquires the bitter taste of liberty so if you have annotation questions you can make comparative analysis of this poem to david diop's africa so i conclude my presentation with a quote from maya angelou for africa to me is more than glamorous fact it's a historical truth no man can actually know where he is going unless he knows exactly where he has been and exactly how he arrived at his present place so that's all for today thank you